Hi dear students, hope you are all doing good. Okay, so welcome to today's uh, Brainiac's capsule. So today we are going to discuss the most important questions or three or four important questions from the chapter Haloalkanes and Haloarenes. Okay, so this chapter is very important. You can expect uh, around two to three questions for the NEET exam. Okay, this year you know that the syllabus for chemistry is cut down. So you can expect more questions from organic chemistry. Okay. So let's start. I hope all of you could see the screen. Okay. Well and good, right? Okay, fine. Okay. Yeah. So let's read the question for you. Okay. Yeah. Increasing order. The first question you can see here. The increasing order of reactivity of the following compounds for SN1 substitution is. Okay. So for those students who doesn't know about SN1 substitution, I will give you a very rough idea uh, that would help you to answer this question a little fast. So SN1 substitution, okay, SN1 substitution, what does it indicate? So SN means nucleophilic substitution. One indicates it is of order one actually, okay. Now the most important features of this particular reaction, okay, this nucleophilic substitution, I can say that this occurs in two steps that is very important occurs in two steps this is very very important so what are the two steps in this one so let us take an alkyl halide let me take a tertiary alkyl halide for you i will tell why i have taken such a uh, tertiary alkyl halide okay so i am taking a tertiary alkyl halide okay now when it is undergoing nucleophilic substitution what will happen actually Okay, so I can say when nucleophilic substitution happens in the first step, that is a step one, the CX bond will undergo breakage. And what you will get, sir, what you will get, you will get a tertiary carbocation. How you are getting a tertiary carbocation? We can say that halogen is electronegative. So what will happen? The two electrons present here will move towards halogen atom. So halogen here will move out as x minus and you will get a tertiary carbocation like this okay so what is the next step so in the second step so this is my first step okay this is my first step clear okay now my second step is this would be attacked by the respective nucleophile so that's why we say it's a nucleophilic substitution so after the reaction, halogen is moving out and another nucleophile is coming here. It would be attacked by a nucleophile. Okay. So you will get a product like this. Okay. I can draw it here. R. Here C. Here you have R. Here you have R. And the nucleophile coming or the nucleophile will donate electrons to the vacant orbitals of the carbon and forms the bond here. So usually it happens in two steps. I hope you understood. So this is my second step. Okay, and please understand the first step is called the rate determining step. Why it is like that? The reason for that is the first step will take time and also the carbocation intermediate formed here should be stable for the reaction to proceed. And the second step if you see here the nucleophile has negative charge and the carbocation has positive charge. So it is more or less like an ionic reaction. So they will attract very fast. So the second step is very fast. So the first step is very slow. So since whenever we learned in kinetics that if a reaction happens in multi-step, then the slowest step will be the rate determining step. That is the reason we say it is the rate determining step. So this is the most important thing. And if you write the rate equation, I can say that the rate would be proportional to the concentration of the alkyl halide here, the tertiary alkyl halide. And there is no nucleophile in the first step. So, and if you see in the rate equation, you can see one. That is why its order is one actually. Okay. So, this is the fundamental thing you should know about SN1 mechanism. Now, let me say, how will you compare the reactivity of SN1 mechanism? Now, you know that only first step is going to determine that. So, I can say, if you are given three to four alkyl halides, whoever is able to form a stable carbocation, whoever is able to form a more stable carbocation that will proceed to or that will move to the carbocation very fast and if somebody is not able to form a stable carbocation uh, it will not 
proceed with the first step very fast so if first step we know it's a slow step but if you want to form the carbocation the carbocation formed should be stable then only the further reaction will happen so how will you compare the reactivity for sn1 mechanism what you need to do you take each of the reactant each of the alkyl halide given here then remove the halogen or break the carbon halogen bond then what you need to do check whether the carbocation formed after that is stable or not if the carbocation formed is a stable one then surely the first step will proceed immediately to form the carbocation then the carbocation will uh, change to the respective product when it is attacked by nucleophile so what is the method methodology to compare the rate of reactivity very simple remove the carbon uh, break the carbon halogen bond check the form the carbocation and check which carbocation is more stable okay the carbocation which is more stable will be formed very we have formed very fast so that means that particular alkyl halide has higher reactivity higher reactivity means it is immediately forming the carbocation okay now we will take the options that is given to you so the first one that is given here is you can see here ch3 okay one minute let me take the pen yeah so first one you have given ch3 okay then you can see this is connected to if you look at the option you can see this is connected to a carbon and this is also connected to another ch3 and this have ch and this is connected to ch2 then cl now what you need to do you break the ccl bond then form the carbocation like this so you are getting a compound like ch3 ch ch3 then you have something called ch2 plus okay now this carbocation if you see this is a primary carbocation this even can undergo rearrangement to form a more stable carbocation like this hydrogen can move to here as what i can say as an h minus okay it can move here so automatically deficiency will come here like this so ch3 here c plus and here ch3 okay and you have ch3 but usually when we uh, compare the reactivity we will not do this proton exchange or we will not do this uh, rearrangement and check the reactivity here we will consider only up to this and say that uh, to form this one it may take little more time okay and how this is stable i can say this is an alpha carbon this is an alpha carbon and this is an alpha carbon so totally associated with each alpha carbon there are three alpha hydrogens are available so totally nine alpha hydrogens are available so by hyper conjugation i can say this is stable by hyper conjugation clear by hyper conjugation i can say this is stable now let's check the next option next option is ch3 ch2 cl this one okay see here this is the one so for that one if i am taking it you can easily see here okay i'm taking a different color so you can see here ch3 ch2 cl now similarly i am i need to break the ccl bond okay but if you are breaking it you are going to get a primary carbocation and i know that a pair of primary carbocation is highly unstable why because it has only this is my alpha carbon and it has only three alpha hydrogen so as the number of alpha hydrogen increases a compound's stability increases by hyperconjugation so from this itself i can say this will not turn into this one very fast okay because this is not stable clear now next check out the third option okay so if you see the third option you can say this is that one i have already drawn for you to save the time this is the compound now again here we need to break the ccl bond while breaking you will get a compound like this now you can see this is stabilized by resonance why double bond okay you can see here double bond single bond positive charge so there is conjugation is present correct positive uh, okay i will take a different color so positive charge single bond double bond again single bond double bond 
single bond, double bond. So there is a conjugation. So this is stabilized by resonance site actually. So if somebody, some carbocation is stabilized by resonance, then it is more stable compared to hyperconjugation. So when I am trying to draw the resonating structures, I could see that in the first step, this pi bond will move towards the positive charge. Then the positive charge will come here. In the next step, double bond, single bond, positive charge. This double bond will move towards the positive charge like this. Then you will get the positive charge here. You can see here like this. Now it has two possibility. One is this pi bond can move to here or this lone pair can move to here and form the pi bond. So based on that, two resonating structures are obtained. So one structure like this, this lone pair is moving to here and forming the double bond. Other is this pi bond is moving to here you can see here then positive charge will come here and in the last step this pi bond will come here and forming so totally how many resonating uh, how many resonating structures are available that is very important okay very very important if you see you can see here one okay starting from this one two three four okay you can see that okay so totally six are available how many are available? Six resonating structures are available. So I can say for this one, it has a more stable structures or six resonating structures. Six resonating, six resonating structures. So six resonating structures are available for stability. That means, what is, what is that meaning actually? That is very important. So that means this compound will immediately break the bond and will try to form the carbocation very fast because that carbocation is a highly stable one. So it will try to move to a stable state very fast. Okay, that means it has a good reactivity. That means it is moving forward. Reaction is proceeding forward to form the carbocation. Okay. Now let's check the last option where you have there is no OCH3 or methoxy group is there. Okay. Only the just CH2Cl. So here also we will break it and you can see here I am drawing the resonating structures similar to the old one. But the only difference is there is no extra resonating structures that was available for the earlier option as you have seen. Okay. Other than that the resonating structures are similar. So I can say here five resonating structures are there. Five resonating structures are there. Five resonating structures are there. Okay. So we can say as the number of resonating structures increases, stability increases. So tell me, sir, which one will be most reactive here? Most reactive means it will immediately move to the uh, intermediate stable carbocation state. So I can say from the given options, C looks more stable, C looks more reactive, it will break the bond immediately and move to the more stable carbocation intermediate and the next one is we can see d that is also stabilized by resonance so we say see d then only a comes why because a needs to undergo also a rearrangement that is the reason a is coming after that and also it is stabilized by hyperconjugation then finally the b comes so which option will correspond to that so i can say option three would be the my correct answer reactivity okay I hope it is clear for you. Any doubt? It's completely clear, right? Okay. So you can uh, see, I want you to draw these resonating structures and analyze. That is very important. So questions like this, we will discuss further also. Uh, yeah. Now, now, next to switch to the other question. Okay. So this is also based on an SN1 mechanism, but it's a graph based question. Question here is, which of the following, listen, which of the following potential energy diagrams represents an SN1 mechanism? Okay, so here we need to think a little. Okay, very simple thinking is required only. Very simple thinking only required. Okay, so we know that in an SN1 mechanism, we have a reactant. This reactant will change to an intermediate stable state that is called reaction intermediate. And here that is a carbocation. And I know this is a stable state. This is a stable state. Then finally, this carbocation would be attacked by the nucleophile. Okay. And it will form the final desired product. This is the way in which the reaction happens. So let's try to analyze this graphically. So I can say, let me say energy diagram. Let me let, I am, let me try let me try to draw. 
okay yeah listen it's very easy only just analyze it properly you will get it okay yeah so let me draw an energy barrier diagram for you okay so this is my potential energy on the y axis okay so that represents the energy required for the reaction and this is the progress of the reaction so as the time goes how the reaction is progressing okay so let's try to understand so initially you have a reactant reactant is a stable one we know reactant is stable initially and we, we use heat also we use temperature and pressure to make it unstable so initially it is stable means energy would be lowest so as you move up energy is high so let me say here energy is lower let i am assuming it even you can make it lower also no issues so energy is lower now you are applying temperature and pressure in a large amount to make it what listen uh, you are applying energy and pressure temperature and pressure in a large quantity to break the bond and what you can see one minute here the problem is it is changing to a straight line okay yeah so let's see so you are applying energy so that means energy is increasing why energy is increasing you are applying temperature and pressure temperature and pressure temperature is a form of thermal energy so it is increasing and finally it is forming a carbocation which is a stable state but please understand this intermediate is not that much stable like a reactant so energy will decrease while forming what the carbocation so i can say this dip this formation this dip formation is due to reaction intermediate now again what will happen the nucleophile will come and attack and what will happen the energy increases and finally it decreases and it forms a product which is more stable than the reactant so you can see more stable how you understand more stable because the energy of that is very much lower that's why it is coming very down compared to the reactant reactant has this much energy and the product has very less energy that means it is more stable okay so my graph looks like this so which graph will be corresponding to that one you can see easily the option 4 will be corresponding to that one correct so you can see initially this is the energy increasing and it is forming the carbocation intermediate again nucleophile attacking energy is increasing and it is forming a stable product like this okay i hope you understood okay so questions like this until now it didn't came for neat you can expect this for this year's neat exam so please understand it if you still have the doubt feel free to put as a comment in our comment box okay still you need more support means come to brainiacs classes we have wonderful crash course please join as early as possible only limited seats are available okay let's go let's move forward so we have the next question in front of you so here I am trying to introduce you the concept of nucleophilicity because the whole chapter talks about nucleophilic substitution. That means the nucleophile is going to attack the carbocation intermediate. So you should be knowing which nucleophile is more uh, reactive or which will if you are given four to five nucleophiles which will attack very fast. All this comparison is very important in this chapter okay here they are asking you the increasing order of nucleophilicity of the following nucleophiles so let us first try to understand its theory and then we will come back to this question okay that is one way or we can even discuss this first and then we will go so the first one is ch3coo minus let me draw that then you will get a clear picture ch3 c double bond o o minus this is one nucleophile why it is called a nucleophile because it has negative charge nucleophile means it's a nucleus loving nucleus loving means nucleus has positive charge so positive loving positive who will love positive charge negative charge only will love positive so that's why it is a nucleophile then we have water then somebody will think sir there is no negative charge then how can it is a nucleophile a, a, a species can become a nucleophile in two ways either by getting a negative charge or by having a lone pair so oxygen has two lone pair that is the reason why it is a nucleophile okay next one we have ch3 so 3 minus okay you have s double bond o like this okay then o minus like this this is the next nucleophile and the last nucleophile they have mentioned is oh minus okay so always what you need to remember while comparing the nucleophilic strength is always charged nucleophiles charged 
nucleophiles are more reactive or have more nucleophilicity than uncharged nucleophiles uncharged or neutral nucleophiles neutral nucleophiles so from the four options only one is a neutral nucleophile that is water because it doesn't have any charge it has only lone pair other three are charged nucleophiles now how we can compare these charged nucleophiles i can easily say all of them are made with oxygen atom so i cannot make a comparison here but next one if i am taking i can say from this one oh minus will be the stronger nucleophile i will tell you the reason don't worry the reason for that is the other two can exhibit resonance so if you take acetate ion this can exhibit resonance like this negative charge single bond double bond so the negative charge will move in this direction and this pi bond will move in this direction so you will get ch3 c o minus and you have double bond o so what is the impact of that impact of that is this negative charge is not stationary it is keep on moving if some charge is keep on moving then that negative charge can attack a particular positive charge with a lesser frequency because we think like okay the attacking site is maybe this one attacking site is this one but immediately it keeps on changing and move to the other thing so as the number of resonating structures increases the nucleophilicity decreases so here if you see in this particular one you can see this can enter into resonance with this oxygen atom or it can enter into resonance with this oxygen atom so that means it has uh, more resonating structures so i can draw that for you listen I can draw that for you. Let me rub this and draw it for you. Okay. So that means that charge is very much mobile and it is not available at a specific location for attacking. So I can say one of its resonating structures would look like this. Okay. So here negative charge will come and this, this will come here and you have double bond O like this. And the other one would be like this CH3. Yes. You have double bond O here and here you have O minus. Okay, so that means it has three resonating structures. So based on this, I can say the next stronger nucleophile is CH3COO minus. Then comes our this one. Okay, here it's not clear. Okay, one minute. Yeah, COO minus. And then comes what is called CH3. SO3 minus and then comes finally our neutral nucleophile water H2 so this would be the order so if you are comparing in this sense I can say who will be the first one having greater strength I can say OH minus D should come yeah here D is coming and then A should come A then C should come then B should come so I can say option 1 would be our correct answer okay I hope it is clear. Hmm? Now I will also explain some of the important theories associated with the nucleophilicity. So we can say there are four key factors that contributes to nucleophilicity. One is the charge and the other is the electronegativity. Third one is which solvent you are using in the reaction medium and the fourth one the steric hindrance that means how much bulk that particular nucleophile is. First I will explain with respect to charge. So we can say nucleophilicity is directly proportional to an atom's charge or as the charge increases or electron density increases the nucleophilicity also increases. One simple example here is you can see OH minus and water. Surely this is a charged nucleophile so this is having higher nucleophilicity. Here NH2 minus and NH3 so this is having a charge so surely this is having higher nucleophilicity. HS minus and H2S here also you can see this is having a charge so that's the reason. Here also you can see CH3COO minus this is without that even though it has lone pair it is a nucleophile but this is charged one so that's why it's coming like this. Okay I hope the idea is clear uh, with respect to charge. You can compare phenoxide ion and phenol. Phenoxide ion is more stronger nucleophile than phenol. So what is my conclusion? Tell me sir. The conclusion is very simple. Nucleophilicity increases as the electron density on an atom increases. Clear? 
Now the next rule is with respect to electronegativity. Very simple. We know that as you move from left to right, as you move from left to right in a periodic table, what will happen? We know that electronegativity increases. So we can say in that case the nucleophilicity decreases or we can say from if you move from left to right electronegativity if increasing then the nucleophilicity decreases or the other way nucleophilicity increases with the decreasing electronegativity. Why we are telling like that? The reason for that is if an atom is more electronegative it will have a greater tendency to hold the negative charge to hold the negative charge towards the nucleus. So it will not be willing to donate that negative charge. We know that a good nucleophile is something that is capable of donating its negative charge or a pair of electrons to the vacant orbitals of carbon. But if something is more electronegative means it the nucleus will attract that negative charge towards it and it will not be willing to donate that pair of electron to the vacant orbitals of carbon. That is the reason the trend is like this. Now we are comparing it. You have something called CH3 minus, then NH2 minus, and OH minus, and then F minus. You can see here negative charge here is present on carbon, then nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. And we know that carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. So this is like a row in a periodic table. So we are moving from left to right. So I can say that from this one, fluorine has the highest electronegativity. If it is having the highest electronegativity, this would be my weak nucleophile. And this would be my strong nucleophile because it is having less electronegativity. So I can say this is my strong nucleophile. So that is the reason CH3 minus is having greater strength compared to NH2 minus and which is having a greater strength compared to OH minus and which is having a greater strength than F minus. Clear? I hope this idea is clear. Now the most important one that is the solvent. So we can say nucleophilicity also depends upon the solvent medium. Okay, suppose you are in a polar protic solvent. Polar protic solvent means something that solvent is capable of donating H plus. That type of solvent is called polar protic solvent. For example, water. You can say water on ionization, it can easily donate H+. And why, what is the importance of such a solvent actually? Such a type of solvent can easily form hydrogen bonding because hydrogen is available in a polar protic solvent. So the problem here is, here you have F- is present, iodine Br- minus Cl- minus F-. minus. So if you are comparing this, you are comparing in a group wise, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Even many students used to say, sir, the charge density of F- minus is higher, sir. So F- minus has more charge means it is a stronger nucleophile but please understand here in a polar protic solvent here F minus can form the strongest hydrogen bonding with the hydrogen it is since it is a polar protic solvent so what will happen if F minus is forming a hydrogen bond with the hydrogen then this F minus is not available a nucleophile should be fast enough to move to a vacant orbitals of carbon or to the substrate but here this is locked by the hydrogen of the polar protic solvent due to hydrogen bonding so that is the reason why in a polar protic solvent i minus which is having a bigger size that would be a stronger nucleophile so many students argue with me stating that sir iodine is a bigger atom so if somebody is bigger it will find very difficulty in moving actually mobility would be less but here please understand even though fluorine is having a lesser size it is locked it is blocked by hydrogen due to hydrogen bonding that is the reason this question has a higher probability to come in a polar protic solvent always the i minus is a more strong stronger nucleophile than Br minus, than Cl minus, than F minus. But now you can see all are, all these are examples of a polar protic solvent. Water, here alcohol has H, here also alcohol has H, here acetic acid can donate H plus, here uh, this is uh, acetic acid, this can also donate H, correct. 
Now, what is the case if it is an aprotic solvent? What is a polar aprotic solvent? Somebody who is not capable of donating an H+. So here you can see hydrogen is available along with the carbon. It is not available with the oxygen or electronegative atom. If a hydrogen is attached to an electronegative atom, then only that can be donated as an H+. Here hydrogen is connected to carbon only. Okay, here also hydrogen is connected to carbon. So these type of solvents are called polar aprotic solvent, which is not capable of donating an H plus to the medium. In that case, I can easily say the fluorine is free. This time fluorine F minus and I minus are free. And I know that F minus has a greater charge density and also it has a lesser size. Size is very less, so it is very fast to go and attack the respective uh, substrate which is having the positive charge. That is the reason why in a polar aprotic solvent, F- is a stronger nucleophile than Cl-, which is a stronger nucleophile than Br-, which is a stronger nucleophile than I-. minus. I hope you understood the concept. Okay. Now coming to the last one, steric hindrance. Very simple, steric hindrance we can compare with ourselves. If we are very much fat, it will be very difficult for us to walk or run. Very simple. So if I am comparing here different nucleophiles, you can see the last one, it's called tertiary butoxide ion. So you can see the bulkier CH3 group is attached to it. So if this needs to run, if this needs to move to a vacant orbital or the positive site or the vacant orbital of a carbon, this needs to run with these three CH3 group. That is very bulky and it's very difficult. So that is the reason why here methoxide ion has a greater nucleophilicity compared to ethoxide ion. So ethoxide ion has one more CH2 unit so that is making it little more bulky so as the number of CH3 or CH2 unit increases the bulkiness increases and its nucleophilicity decreases hope you understood okay so that's all about uh, nucleophilicity I got you got a fair idea now coming to the last question it's an assertion and reason model you know that recently need uh, for uh, they have introduced assertion and reason model type questions that will consume a lot amount of time so surely you need to practice a lot of a lot number of questions of this type okay in brainiacs classes we are doing exclusive sessions on assertion and reasoning for uh, and match the following for our students to get a huge practice okay so let's read the assertion so assertion and reason how you answer it very simple if both a and r one uh, assertion is a statement reason is also a separate statement there can be cases where assertion is true reason can also be true sometimes reason will be the correct explanation for the assertion okay so you need to read understand and answer it okay sometimes assertion will be false and reason will also be false so first read the assertion the assertion states that vinyl halides vinyl halides do not undergo nucleophilic substitution easily that is very much correct sir vinyl halide means something like this ch2 double bond chcl this is a simple vinyl halide so how will you identify whether it's a vinyl halide or not very easy suppose you have a unit like this carbon double bond carbon and that is connected to a halogen i can say this is a vinyl halide this is a vinyl halide. And how will you identify an allyl halide? Allyl halide means you have a carbon, double bonded carbon, and that is connected to a single bond carbon, and that is connected to a halogen. This is called an allyl unit. I will write here. This is my allyl unit. Allyl halide. And this is my vinyl or vinylic. Anything you can say. Vinyl halide. Okay, now why vinyl halide has a less reactivity? The reason for that is very simple. You can see here vinyl chlorine or halogen. You can see lone pair, single bond, double bond. I can easily say this can enter into resonance and what will happen sir? Here you can see this will move to here and this will come to here. So what will happen here? Negative charge will come. Here CH double bond chlorine. Here positive charge will come with lone pair. Two lone pairs okay three lone pairs are actually available for chlorine okay so what is happening there is a partial double bond nature is coming between let me say i will number it this is carbon one this is carbon two and this is my chlorine here you can see a partial double bond nature is coming here full time this won't be there but so to break this bond would be very difficult and this is one reason we say vinyl halides are less reactive they are 
less reactive why they are saying less reactive because it is not able to break the carbon halogen bond very easily and the reason for that is the partial double bond nature between the carbon and halogen this is one reason also some people used to say if you break this suppose you are breaking this you are going to get a carbocation like this like this and this carbocation is highly unstable if something is unstable and we know this is a stable one through resonance will it try to move to an unstable state through reaction no it will not try that is the reason we say uh, vinyl halides are less reactive in nature because already the vinyl halide is stabilized by resonance so when it try to form the carbocation which is unstable in nature understood suppose uh, in, in the case of allyl halide the case is totally opposite so if here if you are breaking this one you are getting a car intermediate which is stabilized by resonance double bond single bond positive charge so here the intermediate is stabilized by resonance so always it will try to move to this particular state then i can say this allyl halide is highly reactive so very simple always the reactant or whoever it is try to move to a more stable state only so if this is more stable it will try to react in very fast to move into this particular state okay so i hope you understood now what is the reason they are saying even though the intermediate carbocation is stabilized by loosely held pi electrons the cleavage is difficult because of strong bonding is that a correct reason is the intermediate carbocation is stabilized actually no it is unstable only because there is no resonance or nothing is present so i can say the reason is completely a wrong statement so i can say here assertion is a correct statement but reason is a wrong statement so option 4 would be my correct answer assertion is correct but reason is a wrong statement clear so i hope uh, you have enjoyed today's uh, brainiacs capsule so those students who want to note it down please note it down we are going to continue this and please if you uh, if you liked our uh, explanation and everything you can subscribe our channel surely you are going to get very info very important information tips with respect to neat all important questions everything we will discuss here until the last day before the neat exam okay thank you